Romans chapter 16. Please turn there in your Bible. Romans, the book of Romans chapter 16. I've entitled this today, The Enemies of the Church. The Enemies of the Church. Now, as we have gone through this series, uh, uh, I look back, you know, when we began it, I, I came up with the title, Romans, God's Marvelous Plan for Man. And we have seen that over and over, and that continues through this series. In chapters 14 and 15, we saw that Paul gave us a wonderful teaching showing us that we can have liberty as Christians and at the same time, unity. Now, a lot of people think that's an impossible thing. It isn't if we're biblical, okay? We can have liberty and unity, and this is what the Lord wants in His church, we, that liberty honors the individuality of human beings, okay, and, and the fact that we all have different gifts and so forth, but there needs to be a unity. There needs to be a unity in purpose and plan. What is it we're trying to accomplish? And that's a beautiful balance when a church has that because it will be an atmosphere of grace. It'll be an atmosphere of enthusiasm, excitement about Jesus Christ, okay? And, and we're not, it's not cookie cutter, kind of thing. No, it's individuals, but it's individuals like-minded, those who are wealthy, those who are not, those who have a higher education, those who don't, okay, uh, those who are this, those who are that, everybody coming together, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's what God wants. That's what he, he wants his local church to be. And when it's right, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. But when it's not right, it's a nightmare. We need unity. And we need unity, why? Because a unified church is a more effective church. That means we're all on the same page. That means we're all thinking biblically the way we should. We need to be striving together for the faith of the gospel. But the reality is this. There will always be those who live their lives for selfish purposes. And there are those, listen, I hope none of you are so naive that you would disagree with this statement. There are those who are deliberate troublemakers. Troublemakers. Both from without and from within. Even today, we have many who, while they say the Bible is their standard, it is really their own agenda that drives them. So they may say with their lips, oh, the Bible, I go by the Bible, I stand on the Word of God. But they have their own agenda, and they may not even know how much that consumes them. There's nothing more dangerous, listen carefully today, there's nothing more dangerous than a person who knows enough Bible to where they can use it and deceive others for their own purpose. It is vile, it is wicked, it is very deceitful, it is straight from the devil himself, and yet it is real today. And every church from time to time is going to have to deal with this, okay? We need to recognize this as a reality. There are, uh, they are the enemies of the church. Let me say it again. They are the enemies of the church. This is real, and there are real enemies. Oh, no. If you're saved, you automatically just love one another. Well, I mean, you know, we'll just, we'll just air, air hug. Can't hug now right? We're not allowed to hug now. You just got to air hug. You just see somebody 50 feet away and just go. <laughs> Let's look at the scriptures. Romans 16, 17. Now, this has been, the last few chapters have been so positive, so encouraging, right? And then you get this, this verse in verse 17. It says, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Now, there is so much stated in this one verse. This is one of the proofs of Scripture, by the, by the way. God 
puts, he packs so much into even one verse of Scripture. It is so deep and so awesome what he can give us in one verse. Preachers can't do it. Writers can't do it. Author, you know, uh, uh, speaker, no, nobody can do it except God. I believe it can apply, this verse can apply both to the saved and lost who succumb to the temptation of the devil. All right? So let's, let's go through this. It's mainly two parts today with some uh, sub, sub parts to it. The first part is this, the defining of the enemy. The defining of the enemy. Who, who are they? Let's look at four important phrases here in verse 17. One, divisions. Mark them that cause which cause divisions, okay? A division is a disunion or a schism in the body. The very idea of a division is to split something in two or more pieces. There are those who want to divide the local church. Now, here's the thing. They sound spiritual, but really they are power-hungry and self-driven people people who will come along who are that way. They want a following. More about their motives later in this message, but they want a following is what it comes down to. So they cause schisms. They cause divisions in the church. Second word is the word offenses, okay? Offenses. It means a, it's, it's, it's a trigger, literally the, the trigger of a trap on which the bait is placed, and which, when touched by the animal, springs, and it causes it to close in an entrapment. There are those who, who cause, uh, they set up traps, and they cause traps, and they catch people in different things. Uh, the Greek word here is the word scandalon. We, we get our word scandal from. Somebody comes up with a scandal that causes these problems, Okay. The third uh, statement, cause, uh, cause divisions and offenses, look at this, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. Now, we're going to park here for a few minutes. The doctrine, where is the doctrine found? The doctrine is found in the Word of God, this book. Now, we are to mark those, more about what it means to mark them in a little bit. We are to mark those who cause offenses or divisions and offenses contrary, in other words, contradictory to the doctrine which we have learned. Now, the word doctrine, uh, let me say this, because there's a lot of misunderstanding about this today. When we talk about doctrine, uh, people say, well, I know what doctrine is. Doctrine is like systematic theology. You know, it's studying what the word sanctification means, justification, glorification, propitiation, redemption. That's, that's doctrine. It's, it's where you've got these outlines and there's all these, these uh, uh, theological phrases. That's what, that's what doctrine is. Well, that is doctrine, but friend, it's more than that. Here's the truth of it. The word doctrine simply means teaching. That's all it means. And while it includes those things, it also includes things such as Christian living. How are we are to treat one another? Do you know teaching how a, a husband-wife relationship is supposed to be? Do you know that's teaching Bible doctrine? Yes. It is, because it's teaching Bible teaching. And that's really all it is. This is not just basic foundational truth, but anything the Bible says clearly. Clearly, so you notice we are to mark those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrines, the teachings which we have learned, and we are to avoid them, all right? Now, here in the context, it certainly would apply to the great truths of Romans. In other words, he's saying, listen, uh, you're to mark those who cause offenses, uh, divisions and offenses contrary to the, the, the teaching you've learned in this letter, but it's more than that, obviously, but it certainly would apply to that. See, you cannot know the truth, or excuse me, you, you don't know the truth. Let me put it this way. If you don't know the truth, you cannot defend against lies, okay? 
If you don't know the truth, you cannot defend, you cannot resist the lies that will come. And the, the uh, Christendom today or Christianity today is in such bad cases to where there are so few churches who are actually teaching the Word of God as the Word of God is, and what it makes for is anemic Christians, if they're Christians at all, okay? They can't explain any, they can't explain any Bible. They can't, most people can't even explain how to be saved. Well, how are we to defend against error in that area when we don't even understand the truth itself? You can't do it. We need to learn the Word of God. And this is, this is good reason for us to know and to believe and to obey the Word of God in context. When we know and when we believe and when we obey the Scripture, that will help us stand against errors when the errors come. I cringe. Now, it's been a long time since we've been in a Christian bookstore, okay? And I'm not saying everything in a Christian bookstore is bad. But let me tell you something, okay? This may sound strange, and I don't mean to ruin your day. The vast majority of stuff you find in a Christian bookstore, as far as books, has false doctrine in it. There's false doctrine. You might say, well, wait a minute, I read that book, there were some good things in there. I didn't say all of it was false. This is where it's a problem. Because here's the truth of it, folks. Even somebody that we would consider a false teacher today is teaching probably a great amount of truth. That's what makes it so difficult to discern. Because we hear the good and we figure, oh, they're fine. They're fine. But here's the truth. If they're teaching error... Let me ask you this. How much arsenic do you have to consume to die? You could have a beautiful lemon meringue pie or key lime pie. You don't need to put a lot of arsenic in there to kill somebody. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. See, a little false doctrine will mess up a person big time. Big time. You might say, well, then how do I know what's false and which? Here it is. Here it is. The Bible has never led anybody astray. Did you know that? See, we, have our, we hear people, and we'll, we'll hear people say all kinds of stuff as far as how to be saved. You need to give your heart to Christ. Commit your life to Christ. Invite Jesus into your heart. You need to turn from all your sins. You need to make Jesus Lord of your life. You need to put him on the throne. You need to be a Christ follower. You need to do this. You need to do that. And we hear all these things. You might say, why doesn't somebody just say, trust or believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Can I tell you why? Because they're listening to too many people and not God. Because they're reading too many books and not the book. And so we end up reading all these books and we, are just re we end up repeating all the errors that keep repeating. Well, I'm saying it this way. Why? Well, Dr. So-and-so says that. And he must be right because he's got a big church. Listen, you don't determine right by the size of a congregation. A big church doesn't make the doctrine right, and a small church doesn't make the doctrine wrong. And a small church doesn't make the doctrine right, and a big church doesn't make the doctrine wrong wrong. We judge everything by this book. This is the standard. That's why we call it the canon, okay? The word canon there doesn't mean that this thing like they used in the Civil War that would blast people. No, C-A-N-O-N, it means the rule, the standard. This is the standard that we go by. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Boy, this next phrase. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing it. You might say, well, th that's going to take a lot of work. Yes, it's a lifetime. That's why when you have a church that is sound to the faith, that is doctrinally sound, that church should be cherished. That church should be promoted. 
okay? That church should be talked about. Why? Because it's becoming rarer and rarer today. We get emails all the time, people saying, I wish there was a church in my area that preached the gospel of grace. I can't find one that doesn't put works into the gospel. That's a real problem. It is a real problem. And then you've got all these study Bibles that have false doctrine in them. I think one of the most dangerous tools in all the world is a study Bible. Now, look, study Bibles can be wonderful. But, friend, let me tell you something. <clears throat> what study Bibles have is they'll have text and then they'll have notes underneath it. The problem happens, here's the problem that happens. People make the mistake, psychologically, they make the mistake, well, this is Scripture, but then they think this under here is Scripture too. And they don't understand, this is the fallible work of man underneath. What's above it is the Word of God. Be careful, be careful. And by the way, have you noticed that the study Bibles are getting thicker and thicker and thicker today? Wider and wider and wider. Have you noticed when you look at the pages of many study Bibles today, you'll just have a little bit of Scripture on each page, and two-thirds of it, well, two-thirds of it many times, one-half to two-thirds of it, is man's notes, man's ideas. Dangerous place to go. Is there anything wrong with having one? No, just be discerning. Be discerning, okay, if you're using a study Bible. Here's the truth. False teachers and carnal believers want to bring down the church. Sometimes it is that they don't know, sometimes it's that they don't like the pastor or they have a grudge against him for some reason. That does happen. But sometimes it's simply because they want a following. They're like what you see in, in uh, second or third John chapter 1, verse 9. There was a guy by the name of Diotrephes. Diotrephes. It says this, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence, was among them. He received us not. Okay? He wanted to have the preeminence. These are the enemies of the church. Turn with, hold your place here and look with me to Jude. Jude. It's a little epistle right before the book of Revelation. Jude, chapter 1. Now, if you have more than one chapter in Jude, you've got problems because there's only one chapter. It's one little letter, but it's a powerful, powerful letter. <clears throat> Jude 1, verse 3, he writes and he says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation... It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at that in verse Four, for there are certain men crept in unawares. They're ungodly men. And what do they do? They deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. God says in his word, we need to earnestly contend, to struggle, to wrestle against these kind of people because their purpose is to undermine the faith, the faith. What is the faith? Anything clearly given in the word of God. Now, getting back to Romans chapter 16, we are told to do something that appears to be negative on the surface, but it really isn't negative because it has a positive purpose, okay? It's ultimately positive in the bigger picture. Now, it's not easy to do, and sometimes it's painful for some to do, but nevertheless, it is something we need to do. And what is it? Well, D on your outline, going back to 1617, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them, okay, and avoid them. Who? Those who, who, uh, who uh, 
create divisions and offenses contrary to the teaching of Scripture. In other words, if somebody has a false teaching or if somebody is, is doing something they're not supposed to do in this regard, we are to mark them. That means note them. That means pay attention to who they are and avoid them. Avoid them. We are to keep an eye out for those kind of people and then avoid them. This applies both to the saved and the lost. Now, a lot of people can't handle that. Or you know what they'll do? What they'll do is they'll draw the line. Well, yes, I'll do that. But they think, but it's okay with family. No. Okay? No. We need to stand on the truth of God. We need to stand. I know that that'll cost us at times. And I know sometimes it's not possible. But friends, we are to stand on Scripture and there are times when this can cause unbelievable turmoil and problems in a family. But nevertheless, the Bible is clear. We are to mark and avoid. We don't like that. Because many times we think our friendships are more important than what the Bible says. But that is not what Scripture says. So what do we need to do? We need to know the truth. We need to know the truth. Now, what is the most basic area of all that we need to know and stand on and mark those who, who differ from it and avoid them? What's the basic area? The, basic, the most basic truth of all is the gospel, the plan of salvation. In other words, what does it take to go to heaven? What is the plan of salvation? Now, remember, I'm not talking about avoiding people who are lost and don't know. I'm talking about a pe people who stand against what the Bible teaches. There's a difference. There's a difference. Those who don't know, that's our mission field. We need to try to reach these people. Or those who, who don't see it clearly. Do you remember we talked about Aquila and Priscilla last week and how they reached out to Apollos? There were things he didn't see. He wasn't explaining things clearly. So they said, we can help this person. This person is sincere. And they had a ministry in his life. He wasn't standing against what the Bible says. He just didn't see clearly what the Word of God was saying. And we need to be the same. Now, what about this issue of the gospel? Well, it's really, it's quite simple. Go with me to chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Let me declare this morning this truth. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. What is it? That he is God who took on flesh, who went to the cross when he died on the cross, he paid for all of our sins, past, present, and future. He was buried, and he rose from the grave three days later. And our response to the gospel, that good news, that message of good news, is simply this. All we need to do is believe it. Trust in Jesus Christ that he did that for us, and God will give us as a free gift everlasting life. That is all just believe? Yes, that is all believe. That is what the Bible teaches. It isn't believe and be baptized. It isn't believe and surrender. It isn't believe and do good works. It isn't believe and follow Christ. It isn't believe and give money. It isn't believe and turn from your sins. It isn't believe and be willing to turn from your sins, although that's not a bad thing, but that's not a condition for salvation. It is believe, 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 believe. That's the verb form of the Greek word pistuo. The noun form would be the word faith. We need to have faith, trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. And that is the only way you get saved. Anybody who adds to that is preaching a false gospel. Okay? It is false. According to who? Not according to me. According to the Bible, look at the language in Romans 1.16. Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of Christ. Gospel means good news. For it, do you see that? It, singular. 
For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that, notice what it says, believeth. Does it say anything else? Doesn't say anything else. To the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Okay? As it is written, the just shall live by faith. All right? You're in Romans chapter 1. Go to chapter 3 for just a moment. Romans 3, in verse 23. It says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified freely, freely, by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith, and watch this, without the deeds of the law, by faith apart from good works. That's exactly what it says up here. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Can I tell you, friends, a good 95% at least of the messages out there today that are being preached as the gospel are not the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the full payment for our sins. And our response is simply to believe in Christ or trust in Him that He did that for us. And when we do, He gives us everlasting life. Everlasting life. Now, it's not complicated. But you see, if you're going to stand for the truth, and God is telling us we need to, we are going to have to stand, and when we hear something that's false, say, you know, that's not right. That's false. That's false. Now, there are those who don't know any better, who we can take the opportunity and get with them and try to lovingly explain it. But then there are those who are adamant that it's not false. They'll say, no, no. You people who believe it's just simply by faith in Jesus Christ that you're saved, you're, you're preaching an easy believism, okay? Well, let me ask you this first of all. What is it, a hard believism? What does that mean to believe hardly? Ugh. Okay, good. That was enough. You know, how was that on the scale? Sort of like you go to the fair and you know the thing where the, you hit the thing and it goes up and you're trying to ring the bell on the on the top, and the thing, the ball only goes so far, and it doesn't hit it. Like, okay, I gotta, gotta do it harder. I gotta do it harder. I gotta do it harder. You gotta believe harder? No, friend. A little faith in the right Savior brings eternal life. If you can have, you can have a lot of faith in the wrong Savior, and you'll never make it to heaven. And by the way, the wrong Savior is anything you can do. The right Savior is all that Jesus has done for you as the payment for sin. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. See, this is the only thing that makes sense. If I can't... Uh, Paul said, listen, you foolish Galatians, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? You started out by simple faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit... Uh, in your life, and now you're telling me you have to do good works too to get to heaven? Listen, if you couldn't save yourself to begin with, what makes you think you can save yourself now by your works? No, it's all what Jesus Christ did. It's nothing that we do whatsoever. Turn with me to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. See, this marking and avoiding is part of the Word of God, and He expects us as Christians to obey it. It's not going to make you popular. It's not going to win a lot of friends. Okay? But you will enter into the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ. Remember, Jesus taught that He was the sufficient only Savior. And what did they do to him? They nailed him to a cross. They nailed him to a cross. The Pharisees, the religious teachers of his day, couldn't take it. 
because he was telling them that their good works would not save them. Their religion would not save them, that he was Jehovah God who was the Savior. And he said, unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. They didn't like it. They didn't like it. But he said in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. That's simple. Believe in Christ, trust in Christ, and the moment you do, you have that very moment, everlasting life. Everlasting, yep. You know what that means? Yes, it means once saved, always saved. If it's everlasting, then it lasts forever. If it doesn't last forever, if it could stop for some reason, then it was never everlasting to begin with. You got the wrong thing. But you'll get the right thing. God will see to it if you'll trust in Christ. Now, here we have the same truth you find in Romans. You find it in Titus chapter 3 and verse 10. It says, a man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject knowing that he that is such is subverted or perverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Now, what is a heretic? Is it a little hairy creature you find on a dog in the summer? <laughs> hairy tick? Hardly. I got to tell you this. So we're on our way on vacation this year. We're on Delta. We're flying. I've got the aisle seat. There's the one in between. That's how they're flying now. The one in between is empty. And my wife is, is by the window. And um, I like to get the aisle seat because my, my legs can cramp up, so I have to keep, keep exercising them. So I'm there, and, and uh, I know this is, some of you can't hardly believe this, but I was there. I had my little athletic socks to come up to the ankle, and I had my sneakers on, and I had shorts on and a pullover shirt. I know, some of you can't believe I wear shorts. I really do. And uh, so I'm there, and I'm just minding my own business, and I, and I feel this little, like, tickling on my leg. And I look down, and there's a tick climbing up my leg, okay? Now, I've never had this happen before. I went, and, I, and as soon as I touched him to grab him to pull him off, he tried to dig into my leg. It was almost like you were saying, I'm going to get some before you get me. <laughs> never, never had one quite do that, okay? And so I just tried to squeeze him. I got him off. I tried to squeeze him with my hand, not make a scene. I said, well, you're supposed to sever them with your fingernail. Well, let's not get gross. But anyways, um, I tried to squeeze him, and I threw him down, and I just kind of ran my foot like this on the carpet. <laughs> I don't know if that helped or not. He never came back as far as I know. Now, why did I tell you that? Because the word heretic reminded me of that. <laughs> but what is a heretic? Here's what a heretic is. A heretic, you'll never forget it, hairy tick, you'll never forget it. A heretic, it is... It is a person who chooses false doctrine for himself, and as a result, he becomes divisive. Someone who chooses false doctrine for himself, and as a result, he becomes divisive. This happens. And by the way, there can be people who are doctrinally sound who turn into heretics. They come over a false teaching. By the way, you won't get any of it out of this book. They'll come over a false teaching, and for some reason, they're, they're attracted to it, and they adopt it, and then they start, they hold on to that, and then they start not only believing it, but they also start propagating it. And through that, they become divisive in a local church. Notice what we are to do. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition rejects. So you notice, you get with him, you try to straighten him out, but it doesn't work, you try to do it again. And if that doesn't work, reject him. Reject him. He's out. You have nothing to do with him. Knowing that he that is such is subverted or perverted, twisted, and sinneth, being condemned of himself. We are to stay away from them because they will divide and undermine the church accomplishing his, its mission. Okay? Okay? Years ago, we had a, a couple come to our church. Now, he was a believer. He had gotten saved, but he was, had been following uh, somebody 
who was a false teacher. He had been following an ultra-dispensationalist, all right? And so I sat down. I got him to see it. He came out of it. He was great. They're, they're a very nice couple. They did good for a while. They did good for a while. And then they went into King James-inspired theology, okay, that the translation itself is inspired. Not just be, what's behind the translation, the originals, okay, uh, and, and what, what the King James is based on, the Texas Receptus and the majority of manuscripts. No, they went further than that, that the actual language of the King James was inspired, and that the King James actually corrected the Greek in which it was given. Well, that's heresy, yes, sir. but he started. He started in on it, and it came down to, I, was, I had to say, you need to leave. We're not putting up with this. You need to leave. That's a heretic. Tried to, tried to help him, didn't want the help, but I knew, and it had already started, he's going to propagate this stuff around our church, and we're going to have a church split if we don't step in. So you have to do it. You have to stand. Now, how do they work? Go back to Romans 16 and verse 18. Romans 16, verse 18. For they that are such. So we, we've talked about, we've talked first defining, the defining of the enemies. Now we're going to look at the motives of the enemies. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, even though they say they do, by the way, but their own belly, their own appetites, and by good words and fair speeches they deceive the hearts of the simple. The motives of the enemy. First, they are motivated by selfish gain. Do you see that? Their own belly. They want a following. They want a following. They want to be a big shot. They want to be known. Okay? They will always do it at first in secret. They will have people over. They'll go out to lunch with them, and they'll start planting these seeds, planting these seeds. Beware of people who will never talk to the pastor about an issue, but they'll talk to everybody else about it. Okay? When that comes up, here's what you do, church. You say, oh, have you talked to Pastor Kakuz about this? Well, well, no. Well, listen, let's go right now and talk to pastor. Yowza. Boy, that'll do it. That'll do it. They'll start sweating bullets, or they'll beeline for the door. If that happens, you know what the motive was. It's their own belly, their own appetite. Secondly, they use eloquent and attractive speech. You see that? Good words and fair speeches. To put it in modern language, they try to impress others with theological talk. Okay? Now listen. <clears throat> I have a doctorate in theology. I've been studying the Bible for many years. Okay? I do know a little Greek and Hebrew. They have restaurants downtown. Okay? I'm, that's a joke. But here's the point, folks. There, there is a time for you to know a Greek tense for some reason, but there are people today as soon as you start talking to them about their doctrinal position, they will go hide behind the original languages. Okay? That is a smokescreen. Don't go there. Don't go there. Can I tell you, folks, what you have in your King James Bible is so accurate and so right on. As a matter of fact, the, the, even the language of the King James, which people criticize today, is an actual aid to understanding the original languages. Did you know that? It really is. I can, I can explain that to you at another time. We don't have time today. But here's the point. Here's what I'm getting at. When people start trying to impress with what they know about original languages and this and this form and this construction and all your flags ought to go up. Now, they may not mean anything by it, but they may mean something by it. They may be trying to intimidate you. Well, you're just, you're just a nobody. You don't know all the stuff I do. 
Years ago, this hasn't happened in a long time, but years ago, occasionally we would get a visitor, and I would be preaching, and I would be doing this and that, and they would, they would, they would want to know afterwards, they'd say, what seminary did you graduate from? I really like that message. What seminary did you graduate from? Well, the truth of it is I didn't go to seminary. Now, I've learned a lot since. I got my doctorate from a seminary, but I didn't go to seminary. Oh, well, how do you know this or this or this? Well, you just study the Bible. Study the Bible. It's there. It's there for anybody can have it, okay? And by the way, those people who are so concerned about your education and background usually don't hang around. It's those who just say, you know what? I just love the Word of God. I love it the way it is. I'm just going to read it, understand it, okay? Be careful. And by the way, some of those people, they'll come across as real humble at, at, at first, but then you find out they had an agenda. So they're motivated by selfish gain. They use eloquent and attractive speech to try to impress people. The word where it says fair speech here, okay? It's interesting that the term, we get our, our word eulogize from it. You ever been to a funeral? You go to a funeral and you know this guy was basically, he was, a, he, was, he was probably a partner of Jesse James, and they're talking about him like he was this marvelous person. That's a eulogy. Okay? Now, eulogy can be good too. And hopefully, if there's a eulogy at you, your funeral, everything the preacher says will be true. Right? The good things about us, hopefully those will be true. But fair speech. And lastly, it is their desire to deceive. Do you see that? By good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. To deceive, they must have an element of truth in what they are saying. Because remember, no false prophet or teacher is wrong on every issue. We won't go there, but Philippians 3, verses 18 and 19 talk about the same kind of a situation, okay? Now, we'll pick up on these other verses next week. But let me say this today. There is a battle for the souls of men, and we need to stand on the truth of God. We need to proclaim the truth of God. We need to, before we can do either of those, we need to know the truth of God. And where does that begin? Friend, it begins with you knowing where you're going when you die. So let me ask you this. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Okay. Look up here. If this is you and me, this wallet representing our sin, as we've already seen, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What we need is we need a payment for sin because if we die with our sin, we're going to spend forever separated from God in hell. See, heaven's a perfect place. You can't get in with any sin. You have to be righteous in the eyes of God. None of us are. Because our good works can't save us, that's why God sent his son, because he loves us so much he hates our sin, but he loves us, and he wants us to live with him forever in heaven. But this has got to be gone. That's why Jesus came, to get rid of it. He died on the cross, and when he died, he took our sin upon himself. He made the payment. He was buried. He rose from the grave. He's paid for all your sins. All he's asking us to do is this. Would we believe or trust in him that he made that payment for us? The moment we do, we have everlasting life. The moment you trust Christ, the payment he made is good on your behalf. You have everlasting life. It's marvelous. It's a gift. You can have it if you'll trust in Christ today. Let's all bow in prayer, shall we? Today, with every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around, friend, I urge you right now, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, you can't save yourself. Somebody else is going to have to do it for you. And there is one who did, Jesus. And I urge you right now to trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you'll do that, he'll give you everlasting life. Would you do that? Right where you sit. If you're viewing over the Internet, friend, right where you sit right now, wherever you are, would you just pause and in your mind, will you believe or trust in Jesus Christ that he's paid for all your sins and you're putting your faith in him to get you to heaven. And if you do that, he'll give you everlasting life. Would you do that? Now, if you're here today in the auditorium 
You never understood that until today, and today you trusted Christ as Savior. I'd love to know that. Would you just slip up your hand and put it down? I, you don't have to raise your hand. It doesn't save you, but it lets me know that today you understood it, today you trusted Christ. I'd love to pray for you. Is there anyone? I won't embarrass you. Just slip it up, put it down. Is there anyone? Father, we thank you for this time today, and we thank you for your word. Help us stand true to your word, Lord. Help us stand in a, in a kind way, but in a firm way, built on the convictions of the Scripture, built on what the Bible says. Help us be firm. And help us share the gospel with the time we have left, Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.